I'm just going to get right into it because uh, you guys are going to love this and you're going to love him and you're going to love all of this. And um, it's a long interview. Bring out your notebook and a pencil or a pen. Who uses pencils? Get anymore? ready to learn. Get ready to learn <laughs> because there is a way to reprogram our subconscious, which was programmed for us by our lovely parents and our environment from ages one to seven. And then after that, shit hit the fan. What? <laughs> <laughs> So now we're going to give you the tools to figure it out. Like, why are things you want not happening for you? He's going to tell you why and then how to fix it so that you can have them happen. So without further ado, here is Bruce Lipton. I'm excited and I really appreciate this opportunity because getting this information out to the public is, is the whole idea. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's kind of interesting because um, there are like these, what are called the four stages of scientific acceptance. And, and the first is... Uh, whatever you said is worthless nonsense. Then it goes to, well, that's interesting, but not really what we're doing. And then the third step is, well, it's true, but maybe not that important. And then I love the fourth step. Oh, that's what we always thought. <laughs> so I know. Uh, we're, we're, I've been through all of those, and it's exciting now at least to be in, in, in stage four, um, uh, because when I first started, everyone said, oh, he's a quack and all that kind of stuff. And now it's the main core of where science is. So it's uh, exciting uh, to see it, but more exciting because it takes away victimhood from people uh, who are always looking at, oh, I'm a victim. And it's like, no, you're a creator, but you've just been programmed incorrectly. Yeah, let's talk about that because... I feel like it's hard for people to understand when we've been taught so much about DNA for so long, and then yes. you kind of like turn it on its button, switch it all up on us, and you're like, no, it's not just about that. It's how we, how our environment and kind of our beliefs take that DNA and how it expresses itself is what you end up with. Uh, absolutely. So we're not a victim of heredity. If anything, we're a victim of the programming uh, that we receive in the first seven years of our lives. So the first seven years of our lives, I mean, it's funny, I was talking about this uh, last week, you know, that's when we're at our most innocent, right? That's when we are carefree and happy for the most part. I mean, there are definitely people who are not going through this idyllic kind of childhood, but um, <laughs> Is it when fear comes into play that things change? Uh, absolutely, because th there's something built into the to all biology, from bacteria all the way up to humans. And this thing that's built in is called the biological imperative. The imperative is the drive to survive. Now, it's not just a human thing. If you try to kill a bacterium, it's not even going to sit there and go, oh, okay, kill me. It's going to do everything and it's, you know, capable to escape death. And so why is this relevant is that every organism uh, has a built-in mechanism to try and stay alive. Well, until, until you start putting fears in the system, uh, there isn't anything to worry about. But once fear comes in, then the biological imperative kicks in and it operates unconsciously, controls your behavior to stay alive. And so any threat becomes fundamentally, profoundly important. And you think about it, the first and biggest threat is mortality, that people die, <laughs> things die, mm -hmm. and, and, and our parents are going to die, and then we're going to die. And it's like that fear... <laughs> is ultimately the drive force that unconsciously as we move through the world is making sure that we're safe and so much energy goes into that mm -hmm. and it's a unfortunate situation because we also know that consciousness is creating the whole experience so and, i want to know more about that because i was fear. listening i was listening to different interviews and reading different things that you've discussed and you talk about consciousness and that we aren't, <laughs> it was, I was writing notes last night, um, that we aren't the body, we are consciousness. And so yes. even when we die, we're still there looking for another body to experience creativity and life through. But 
we're consciousness. So when you say we are consciousness, what does that exactly mean? Uh, consciousness is not material. So first right away, it says it's an energy. And then what we also know in the world of physics is energy is neither created nor it's destroyed. So basically it says that consciousness is like a, the, the best analogy, the best analogy, consciousness is like a broadcast. Uh, and let's say the body is like the television set and that it's downloading the broadcast and expressing the behavior. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching a TV show and the television breaks, we say TV is dead. And I go, yeah, of course, TV is dead. It's not working anymore. But the most important question now is, is the broadcast still there? And all of a sudden it says, well, wait a minute. The, the identity that we have is not built into the cells. It's picked up by the cells by antennas on the surface of the cell called self receptors, receivers of self. Uh, and so the cell is like the television set. It downloads the identity uh, as the broadcast and then plays it in a physical realm. But when you die, broadcast is still there. But if another human embryo shows up with the same set of receptors in this point, no two people have the same set of receptors. That's why you can't transplant cells, organs, tissues with each other because the immune system uh, will eliminate any other broadcast that is not you. <laughs> uh, and so uh, this is when we do tissue typing to find out uh, whose uh, donor organ is closest in the broadcast range uh, to your own. So that, that's why you pick a recipient based on the receptors that are on the donor's tissue and the receptors on the recipient. So if we're, con so first of all, I've been reading this book called Hands of Light because I'm really fascinating, fascinated by healing and the powers that exist in us that we haven't tapped into. And reading all of these things about physics and having never studied physics, I'm really fascinated by it. And even, you know, the fact that a leaf first sends its hologram out and before it actually grows, the hologram is there and the leaf grows into the hologram. I mean, like that was mind blowing to me. And in fact, I remember writing a note, I'm going to find it right now, um, where it, it really made me think about if the brain structures sight, I'm at, I've been waiting to ask you this question forever. Here we go. If the brain structures sight, hearing, taste, and smell, and touch holographically, does this mean that maybe we see holographs of events in time despite and against linear space and time? For example, because time isn't linear and the theory of relativity showed that the photos, they showed these photos that were stacked and they had space in between space and time between them. Maybe we see an event holographically that happened at a different time than now. So even if it doesn't happen now, it can't validate our feeling. It happened in another timeline and the way we see it was because of a holograph. Well, basically, uh, if you put the memory into the field and download it, it's whenever you download it, it's real at that moment. So a dream, when you're really in that dream, you can't distinguish reality from the dream at that point yeah and it feels uh, I was real to, uh, it was um hbo's uh the west uh, show about uh the robots and things like that and i think the woman said uh, the guy says to the woman is this real or is this a dream and she responded by saying does it make a difference <laughs> uh, and and why this is interesting is because quantum physics if you talk to a quantum physicist at this very moment and say is what we're experiencing real or is it a simulation like uh, virtual reality? Mm -hmm. The most powerful response that they're gonna offer you is, we can't tell the difference. And when physics can't tell you if this is real or virtual reality, then all of a sudden it says, wow, this opens up a big, a big can of worms, so to speak. Yeah, well, I think that that's so fascinating because if we can give in to that and then the fear of death um, is eliminated, then you can just live kind of freely and happily knowing that there is no end. And this doesn't even really exist in this moment for sure either. Like we don't know for sure whether this is real or not. So who knows whether the dream was real and this is fake 
or that's fake and this was real. I mean, it's... You can't tell. You can't tell. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, let me start with a first understanding. I was not a spiritual person. I didn't believe in this spiritual stuff at all. And that's why I became a scientist. It's like, oh, we're a biological robotic device, proteins and molecules and blah, blah, blah. You're born and then the proteins die and everything's gone. Uh, but when I started to understand the nature that identity is not in the cell, but sent to the cell, uh, that was this moment as a scientific epiphany it says, oh my God, I'm not in the cell. I am a broadcast sent to the cell. Uh, and immediately it said, I can't die. I'm not even in here. And I have to tell you the truth of what you just said. Pre that awareness, my life was like most people's. Oh, I got all kinds of things going on, troubles, that blah, 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 blah. And post that awareness, my life has profoundly changed. And, and, and the fact is this, I firmly, totally believe that this is heaven in the sense of heaven is a place of creation. And here we are creating. Yep. And you can change your creation. <laughs> you could change your mind. And then you go, well, that's kind of weird, Lip. And then I go, you know what? From the biological point of view, that's what convinced me. But once I started to read quantum physics, and, and, and this is an emphasis, there is no science with greater validity or has been tested more than quantum physics. On planet Earth, it is the most valid science on the entire planet. And I say, well, what's the significance? And the answer is this. First premise. That uh, The first premise is consciousness is creating our life experience. That's the first premise of physics. I go, so what's the meaning of it? I said, well, change consciousness and the creation changes. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I have, a, I have two lives on this planet. Previous consciousness caught up in biological imperative, protecting ourselves, you know, assuring that we're gonna be safe and, and mixing that in with real world events, blah, blah, blah. Turns out in this part of my life since then, I don't have to even go out and, you know, and, and track things down. Uh, with changing of consciousness, I have manifested a completely different life on this planet. And I'm not the only one. So uh, there, there's a scientific foundation for this. And the biology that I found, without knowing the physics, supported everything the physicists said. And then when I read the physics, it's like, oh my goodness, the, uh, the biology and physics are saying exactly the same thing. Uh, and that disease, you know, we talk about disease, less than 10% of, of disease is even connected to genetics. It's lifestyle. And I go, yeah. And I say, what's relevant? Change your lifestyle mm -hmm. and your life will change instantly. Well, the other thing I, I loved that you were talking about is, and I always say this to with anyone diagnosed with cancer is, there's also such a, a big emotional component and just hearing you talk about that validated it for me for sure. Um, and, and when you think about the fact that so many of us live in fight or flight and our bodies, our immune systems are so taxed and so tired, it's no wonder that disease creeps in, but you say we can heal ourselves. How do yes. you instruct people to do that? Okay, now <laughs> because we're afraid, right? Okay. And we go to doctors and they tell us to take pills. And so we're afraid we listen to them. But you say there's another route. Oh, there's absolutely another route. If we are the ones that created the illness, and obviously, we're the ones that can change the illness. It didn't happen to us like I'm a victim and things happen to me. I've created this and you go, Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, and this is where most people have a problem, and this is the disconnect. And the disconnect is this. I am going to tell you as we're talking that we are creating this with our consciousness. Okay. And then the average person will say, yeah, but I, my consciousness wouldn't have selected cancer or being out of work or having an accident or anything. And I go, this is where the problem, the whole thing shifts on this. The mind has two interdependent aspects called the conscious and the subconscious. 
the conscious mind is directly connected to the broadcast of who we are, the self. The subconscious mind is a strict record playback mechanism. And so we learn habits. Now, a lot of people say the subconscious mind is evil. I go, no, the subconscious mind is a recording device. It's not evil or, or, or good. It's, just, it's a cold machine. The programs you put into the subconscious, uh, that's where the story comes from. So, you know, give you an example where the subconscious is powerful. Uh, when did you learn how to walk? <laughs> Before you were two. Yeah. Are, are you still walking? I go, yeah. Are you thinking about it? No. I go, automatic subconscious program controls the entire walking process with your intention to walk. Okay. Now, so that's, these are really good things. I mean, you, you learned how to drive a car. And now today, after driving a car, you don't get in there and go over all the details that you did the first moment you sat in behind the wheel and saw the mirrors, the dashboard and everything. It's like, you know, uh, 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 and now you just get in the car and drive without thinking about mm -hmm. it. Habit. Habit is subconscious mind. Okay, now, the habits are programmed into the subconscious mind for a very simple reason. I'll give you an example. We buy a brand new computer. It's got an operating system, but it's got no programs. So what good is it? <laughs> you know, I got a brand new computer. I turn it on, and so so what? It's not going to do anything. Yeah. I have to put in a word program, an art program, a business program. I say, so why is that relevant? I say, once the programs are installed, then I have use of the computer. And once I also learn that I can change the program, then I have power over the computer. Okay, so now I back it up. A child is born. It's mechanistically the brain is a computer. <laughs> it, can, it can process all the things, breathing and every aspect of biology. It's already programmed in there, that part. Behavior? No. That's programmable at the time because behavior changes over civilizations and time. So you can't genetically put program in. It has to be downloaded. So I say, okay, so I download programs first seven years because the brain for the first seven years is not even operating at the vibration of consciousness when you put EEG wires on your head. Mm -hmm. uh, your brain is operating lower than consciousness for the first seven years. The predominant activity is called theta which is imagination, uh, and of course that's the character of a child in the first seven years, is mixing the real world and the imaginary world, uh, riding a broom. It's not a broom to the kid, it's a horse. Having a tea party and pouring nothing into the cup and drinking the nothing and saying how wonderful the tea is, that's theta, okay? But here's the most important aspect, theta is also hypnosis. So whatever we observe, whatever we hear, whatever we experience is downloaded as program, okay? So let's say the fear of death, that, that comes in there real early, okay? So I go, okay, great. I say, but after age seven, consciousness kicks in, that's our creative opportunity, okay? And you go, oh, well, great. If that's my creative opportunity, why would I create trouble in my life, disease or problems in the world? Why, why would I create that? And I go, you didn't. Because, and here's, here's the factor that's the whole thing, 95% of our cognitive activity, our neurological behavior, is controlled by the subconscious mind, not the conscious mind. And it operates invisibly, so you don't see it. And I say, well, why would I operate from that? And the answer is this. Conscious mind can be creative, which it is. But conscious mind can think. I said, well, why is that important? I said, well, thinking is an inside job. If I say, okay, tell me what you're doing on Sunday at 2 o'clock, the answer may not be right out here in front of you. It's inside. So a thought redirects consciousness to the inside where thinking occurs. Oh, yeah, but if I'm walking down the street or I'm driving a car and my consciousness lets go because it's going inside to think of what I'm going to do, where I'm going, whatever it is, it's thinking, that, that doesn't mean you then crash your car or you walk into a tree. <laughs> I say, and here's the point. The moment the conscious mind is thinking, the brain behavior is turned over to subconscious program. I go, so what does that mean? I say, well, 
<laughs> if I'm in a subconscious program and my conscious mind's thinking, then by definition, my conscious mind's not paying attention. It's thinking. So whatever behavior is coming out when I'm thinking, I'm it's not seeing it because my conscious mind is inside. Huh. So l l let me give you a story. 30 years, the same story, 30 years in lectures, because it is the most beautifully profound, simple story. And that is this. You probably had a friend and you were close to your friend and you knew your friend's behavior very, very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see that your friend has the exact same behavior as their parents. So, you, you know, you get excited and you want to tell your friend, you go, hey, Bill, you know, you're just like your dad. And then I say you back away from Bill. Because the moment you say that, Bill is going to go, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And I go, uh, you know, as soon as I say that in a lecture, people start laughing because they all experience it. Yeah. And I go, most profound story in the world. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad, except for Bill. I said, well, I can explain it. Bill downloaded the behavior that his father expressed in the first seven years. That is the function of being a parent and a child recording. But then I say, but 95% of the day, which is the number, Bill's behavior is not coming from his conscious creative mind. It's coming from his program because his conscious mind is thinking. That's the amount of time, 95%. So I say, then what? I say, well, then 95% of our day we're not creating from conscious reality. Our life is being created from programs. In the subconscious. 70% or more of those programs are disempowering, self-sabotaging, negative, limiting. I go, then of course, we go through the world with great wishes and desires, conscious mind, but expressing subconscious behaviors, which are sabotaging us, yeah. and we can't see them because the reason why we're playing them it's because conscious mind is busy. And then I say, all we see is the result. And I say, so what's the, where's the problem? And here is the problem. Conscious mind wishes love, health, happiness, joy, heaven on earth. But when we look out our eyes and see the result of what's happening in our world and things aren't working for us, <laughs> we're not as healthy as we want to be. Our job isn't as good. Our relationships suck. <laughs> I go, oh, then what is the what is the result in, in regard to that individual? And here it is. I wanted to be successful, but uh, nature is not supporting me. It's not in my fate. It's not in my cards. I am a victim. And that's where the whole thing goes wow. wrong. So then how does somebody get out of that? Creating. How do we get out of that then? If our programming is happening between one and seven and we have absolutely no control over it, right? How do yes. we, because I see it with myself, with all of us, you know, whatever our traumas are or the difficulties that we adopted from that young age. I mean, for me, it was anxiety. My dad was almost dying all the time with his low blood sugar attacks. He's diabetic. My mom was always stressed. So when I look at myself now, I'm realizing, oh, anxiety, that's where it's coming from. And so, and, and that fear, that everyday fear, that fight or flight every day, live or die, um, how do we deprogram that if it's in the subconscious and we can't use our thinking mind? I keep using my thinking mind, Bruce, to try to get myself out of it, and I'm doing really yeah. good work. I'm really trying hard, um, but it's and not like it can be eliminated. Mind, your conscious mind has the programs. Your conscious mind has, yes, health, happiness. This is really what I'm looking for, conscious mind, but yeah. your life's not expressing it because you're not operating from the conscious mind. So your question is be. really profoundly important here. Uh, and the first thing is this, how do I know what the heck the programming is? I, I mean, I was being programmed, as we now know, from the last trimester of pregnancy, whatever your mother was experiencing yes. emotionally, you as a fetus was experiencing, you were experiencing the same thing because her emotional chemistry, which is in her blood, goes across the placenta because blood nourishes the fetus. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about, yes, the mother's blood and get nutrition and be healthy because you're nourishing the fetus. And I go, yes, but blood has more than nutrition. It has information, yeah. hormones, yeah. emotional chemicals. So yeah. a fetus, if the mother is afraid, 
the fetus is afraid, not knowing the details, mm -hmm. but it knows fear because fear is a, a hormonal relationship, adrenal hormones, uh, stress hormones. Uh, a child, even before it's born, can experience this. So the programming starts before birth. But even I was at an energy retreat. Seven. I was at an energy retreat workshop thing where they said that even the grandmother, because the cells that were in your from your grandmother in your mother at inception, that also transfers to you. So you have some of your grandmother in there too. Absolutely, and her because uh, when a, uh, a woman is born. She already has the eggs for the next generation. Yes. So the eggs that were created and genetically influenced even before the, the woman is born. So yeah. there is a connection. It's called epigenetics, uh, which is carried from generation to generation. But, but I think that, that let's be helpful for one second to the audience. And that is this. I say, well, I wasn't there at in consciousness uh, at zero, one, two. I have no idea what the heck the programs were. I wasn't there in consciousness. So the first issue is this. What programs did I get that impact my life before age seven? Mm -hmm. And then here's the, the great answer, because there's an answer, and the answer is this. 95% of your life is coming from subconscious programs. Your life is a printout of your subconscious. So all of a sudden I say, you want to know where your programs are? Look at your life. And I say, what? The things oh, that you like that come into your life have come in because you have a program to acknowledge that. But the struggles, the things that you work hard over, the things you sweat over to make happen, the things you're working on, like, oh, I want this. I'm working. I'm working. The question is, why are you working so hard? And the answer inevitably is, whatever that destination is, it's not in the program. And so your life is a conflict, not with the outside world. The conflict is in the wishes and desires of the conscious mind, which is creative, versus the programs that were downloaded in the subconscious. And when you do the math, you recognize, well, 5% of your life is coming from wishes and desires, and 95% is coming from the program. And all of a sudden you see, oh my God, uh, I've been a victim of the program, and that's where we're coming from. Wow. So how do we deprogram the programs? Is it by, you know, taking note of everything that's in our lives that isn't working now, and then what's the step after that? Once you acknowledge it and you see it, I'm sure that is helpful step number one. If, if first of all, yes, you have to identify where am I having a problem? If I'm trying to get a relationship and I keep failing, well, then your relationship issues are obviously faulty. That's your program, whether you watch your mother and your father and their relationship and you downloaded that and now you're just replaying that, okay? So you say, okay, my conscious mind now becomes aware. I look at my life and I go, God, this isn't working and that's not working, blah, blah, blah. And I say, yeah, but now I want to I want to change that because um, apparently these are subconscious programs that are misdirecting me. Now comes the interesting, uh, and this is so important. Why your question is, is so important is this: is that how do I change a subconscious program? Yes. And and here's why. Here's where the difficulty comes from. The subconscious mind is a habit mind by definition. Habits, you don't want to change every day just because, oh, I, I saw something on TV and I just changed my habits. Uh, you don't want to change that. You learned how to walk before you were two. Thank God the habit is still working and you're still walking. <laughs> That's really great. Uh, so the habit mind resists change. That's the first thing you have to recognize. Second, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind are two different entities. So the conscious mind can have great desires and wishes and the subconscious mind can cancel every one of those. And then you say, well, I'm going to give myself a good talking to. That's the usual thing. Like even I started that way. It's like, oh, God, I, uh, you know, uh, eating donuts, which my partner Margaret calls circles of death, you know, and it's like, <laughs> like, don't don't eat the donut. And then I keep telling myself, don't eat the donut. And then sure enough, I'm sitting there or standing there with a donut in my hand, munching on a donut going, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, you, you're not. What's wrong with you? You can't. And I go, here's the problem. The conscious mind is you. It's live. You're a download, a broadcast coming in, subconscious mind is program, okay? 
And, and the idea is the subconscious mind is equivalent like of a CD recorder or old-fashioned tape recorder. I go, why is it relevant? Well, you can, let's say you put a program on a CD and you push play and the program's playing. And then you say, I don't like the program. So go up and talk to the CD player. Go and talk to that player and say, come on, CD player, let's play something different. I'm not, I don't like this program. Play something different. And you keep arguing with the tape player or the CD player going, I don't like the program. Play something different. The question is, <laughs> most important is, how much talking to the player will it take before the program changes? The answer is, you could talk until you're blue in the face. The program is not going to change. Yeah. You have to push the record button. Oh, my God. There's a record button on the subconscious. And I go, oh, so if you want to change the subconscious, you can't talk to it because there's nobody in there. It's a machine. You're in the conscious mind. Nobody's in the subconscious mind. So talking to the subconscious mind, it's like talk to the wall. It won't make any difference that there's nobody there. And that's our biggest issue because we keep trying to correct ourselves, you know, like, oh, don't do this and don't do that. And then we find we're doing it again. Why? It's a habit. Okay. And I say, well, how do you change it? So now comes, okay, finally get to the answer to the most important question. And that is, how do you change it? And I say, well, how does it learn? How does the subconscious mind learn? Because that's the way you can change it. So I go back and I'll tell you this. The first seven years of life, we learn because the brain was at a lower vibration called theta, lower than consciousness, which is imagination, but also recording hypnosis. And that's why what we see in the first seven years is just like a download of a program. It's not ours. We're observing other people downloading their programs. Well, that's already a problem, <laughs> especially if the people you are downloading a program from, if their life isn't that great, then you just downloaded not great. Yep. So if you want to change the subconscious, number one is hypnosis. And I go, do you mean you have to go see a hypnotherapist? And I go, cool part, no, for this reason. Every night when you go to bed, the vibration of the brain during the day is a higher vibration called beta, like focus schoolwork, okay? And then a lower vibration is called alpha, which is calm consciousness. And below that is theta, which is the uh, imagination hypnosis. And then just below that is something called delta, which is outright sleep. So I say, why is it relevant? Well, if you want to reprogram the subconscious mind, you want to do it when it's in theta. <laughs> so hypnosis is putting you into a low vibration of low alpha or theta, like watching the, uh, the, the old fashioned watch going back and forth. It, it puts you in a low vibration. And when you're in that vibration, you can download new information. So I'm going to mm. give some, a real quick answer and quickly this. Every night when you go to bed, you came home from work, beta, high vibration. You relaxed after work and before going to bed, you went into alpha, calm consciousness. And the moment your eyes or your consciousness disconnects and you fell into that moment of sleep, your brain's not in sleep yet. It's in theta. It takes a little bit longer for it to go into delta, which is like full out sleep. So why is this relevant? Every night when we go to bed, the moment the conscious mind checks out, the brain is now operating in theta. Well, that's hypnosis. So I say, so what? I say, that's why you can put earphones on at night and play a program of what you want in your life. Mm -hmm. Not the what you have, but what you want. And if you play this at night as you go to bed, after a number of listenings, this will actually go straight into the subconscious. Conscious is sleeping. That's why you're sleeping. Theta subconscious is still operating. So by putting earphones on, it's called self-hypnosis. And this is the opportunity to put it in a new program. Every night, you put on the earphones and listen to a program that you want to be your behavior. So, number one, hypnosis. Before you I move say, on okay, from hypnosis. Until age seven. Before you and move on say, from well, hypnosis. I've learned yes, darling, go ahead. Before you move on from hypnosis, I have a couple of questions. So, do substances interrupt the theta reprogramming with hypnosis, like if someone has a glass of wine at night or if they have some marijuana or CBD or anything, do substances interrupt that process? 
I think they can, and I say I think because I'm not going to stand here on any scientific principle, but I think they can. But again, they may not because uh, the conscious mind is really disconnected okay. at that moment that they okay. is in. You're not operating from conscious. You're operating from program. Okay. So and so uh, when you talk if, when you talk about yes? the sub, like not being able to, to talk to yourself and and to get those things to change, right? Talking to your subconscious through hypnosis works because. You're not at subconscious level. You're in theta subconscious, right? That's the yes. d yes. difference. Okay. That that because you've opened up the the record program. Theta okay. is record. So whatever's going in is going to be recorded at theta. Got okay? it. So say first seven years hypnosis recording theta fine, but after age seven you still download programs. I mean you learn how to drive a car. And now it's a habit. You don't have to think of the details. You put the kid in ignition. You could be thinking about your destination and not pay any attention to the driving. In fact, this is one of the stories that I also say. I said, after you've been a driver for a long time, uh, uh, here, here's the point. You have a, a, a passenger in the car. You get into a wonderful discussion as you're driving. And the discussion is going back and forth, back and forth. And I go, really great. Uh, and then you look out the window at some moment. You realize oh, you haven't paid attention to the road for the last five minutes. I go, well, apparently you're still driving and you're safe. It looks okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then here, here comes the, here comes the, the, the punchline. And the answer is, it's this. Can you tell me what the discussion was that you had between you and the passenger? You go, oh, yes. We talked about this and this and this and this. And I go, great. Next question. Tell me what was on the road for those five minutes. And you go, I have no idea what was on the road. I go, Why? Because conscious mind was not paying attention to the road, conscious mind was engaged in the conversation. Who was driving the car? Well, subconscious. It's more powerful. It's a million times more powerful a computer than the conscious mm -hmm. mind. And matter of fact, if, if you're about sliding into an accident, your car's out of control, you know what? Your brain will automatically shut off your conscious mind and switch you to subconscious because it is so much faster. It can control the vehicle. So uh, basically, the uh, subconscious mind is driving the car, but the point was, again, uh, when the subconscious mind is doing a task, the conscious mind is not aware of it. And that's why you can tell me about the conversation, but you can't tell me what was on the road. And I go, well, that's the story of our life right there. Oh, What's wow. on the road <laughs> so when we're not paying attention to it. So one uh, is subconscious and is, is hypnosis using hypnotherapy yeah. to, to manifest First seven or years. change things. Yeah. But after age seven, you learn new programs through what? Repetition. That's why it's called habituation, habit. If I repeat something over and over and over again, that is the function of putting a new program into the subconscious mind. So uh, I, I like the uh, current new age phrase. It's kind of funny. It's like, fake it till you make it, <laughs> meaning... If you want to be happy, then just say I'm happy and keep saying I'm happy in spite of what's going on in the world around you. And the reason is this, the repetition of I am happy, I am happy, I am happy becomes a habit. And then once it's a habit, the 95% of your life coming from the habit subconscious mind will generate happiness without you putting any effort into it. That's the beautiful part about when the programs go in that support you, you could be mindless and walk through the world and be the happiest person in the world because you don't even have to focus on the details. That's subconscious mind. So phase one, you can do hypnosis. Phase two, you can do repetition and habituation to put something new in. And then there's a new thing, and this is like the thank you, God, we needed this. Uh, it's called energy psychology. And energy psychology engages something called super learning. Uh, just for an example of what is super learning, maybe you've seen people read a book by just moving their finger down the page. As fast as they move that finger is as fast as they read everything on that page. That's an example of super learning. Whoa. If you, if you use that super learning technique, and here's like, oh, my God, we needed this, uh, you can download new behaviors in about 10 minutes. What? Uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's the most exciting thing in the world and most necessary. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. 
uh, human civilization is facing an extinction right now, the sixth mass extinction of life, uh, but it's caused by human behavior. So we want to not go extinct, and we darn well got to change that behavior as fast as we can. And this is why uh, at this time, energy psychology has come into the realm of uh, belief change processing. So where do we learn super learning? Well, just to give you, uh, on my website, which is simple, brucelipton.com, I have under resources about 25 or more different versions of energy psychology with their websites and a little paragraph about each one so you can feel like, oh, this one feels good to me, then go try it out. Uh, uh, you know, and, and the thing is this, I'm not saying this because that sounds like a good idea. I'm saying this because as A, a biologist who comes up with some understanding, and then B, as a human who lives it, my human experience has been profoundly changed to the very positive through energy psychology. And people I know all around me have come out of disease states and, uh, and come out of, you know, living a, a, in an un unhappy world and created heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. that, that's why we're here, actually, to create the most wonderful, beautiful experiences. And if you're not getting those programs in at the very beginning, then the rest of your life, until you change those fundamental programs, will be characterized by what you downloaded in the first seven years. I love this. I I also wonder, I want to talk about energy work and how it clears blockages and all of that too. Um, but going back to the grandmother and the mother and it being passed down to you, is it possible because those cells are transferred along that their traumas become your traumas having not gone through them, that you almost feel like something happened to you, but you know it didn't happen to you, and now you realize it's because it happened to your grandmother, and now understanding that connection, maybe that's why? Well, this is the new insight. It's not that new now about the nature of our grandparents influencing us. This actually was research that started after World War II, where it turned out that people uh, who, whose parents were in World War II and suffered all the problems of uh, malnutrition and stuff because of food shortages, turns out that their offspring were altered in their, their whole behavior, digestive system and everything, uh, based on the parents' requirement to change their behavior to live in their world. And so it was passed to that generation, but now we also find that it goes down, it could go up down to maybe five generations of wow. things that happened that are coming into your life today. But then I say, wow, I mean, I'm carrying all this weight from history. Uh, does that make any difference? I go, no, because reprogramming can change it right now. So it's irrelevant what happened in those years before, but it's only irrelevant if you change the program. If you don't, you're just gonna play the same darn program over again. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a very, very important fact. Um, they were following the fate of children uh, who were adopted into families where cancer was running in the family. And we always said, oh, cancer must be genetic. It's running through the family from one generation to the next. And then guess what? We find that when children are adopted into a family like that, the adopted child will get the same family cancer with the same probability as any natural sibling, except the adopted child came from totally different genetics. The cancer was not genetics, it was programming. And this is the, the, the most important part because the positive side of it is if it is programming, we can change the program. And when we change the program, we have empowered our lives. And what was the programming in those families that that child adopted to get the cancer, I wonder? Uh, most of them are, are stress programs. Most of them are the, uh, the idea is that you live in a world that you have no power over and that you are a victim and, and your life is not in harmony. Your life has a lot of anger built into it because you realize, oh my God, I can't get a break in this world. Uh, and it's like, uh, it's like the world is against me. And, and as a result, uh, we see ourselves as victims. And so victimization leads to what? Anger, resentment, all these things like that. Well, if you build that up, that's chemistry. Anger is a chemical. <laughs> it's a thought 
which is translated by the brain into a chemical that goes through the body. And that chemistry is what affects epigenetics, the genetic expression. So if you have really good chemistry, then the chemistry going to your cell is going to enhance your health. But if you come from anger, resentment, violence, all these kinds of backgrounds that, that threaten us, well, that chemistry isn't going to promote health at all. Mm -hmm. I say, yeah, but where's the chemistry coming from? The brain is the chemist. And I say, yeah, but what chemistry should the brain release? I go, it's a translation of the picture of consciousness. Simple point. You sit there, your eyes are closed, you open your eyes, and you see someone you love. That's a vision of love. I go, so what's the consequence? I said, the brain will release things like dopamine, pleasure, oxytocin, bonding to your loved one, vasopressin, uh, which makes you more attractive, uh, and growth hormone. And that's why when people fall in love, guess what? They have that glow about that. People say, oh, look how in love they are. See how healthy they glow. I go, health is a reflection of the consciousness of love. In contrast, if I live in fear, <laughs> If I live in that concern, the chemistry is not going to be dopamine, vasopressin, all that stuff. It's going to be stress hormones. It's going to be cortisol. It's going to be factors that affect the immune system and shut down the immune system. I go, so here's a person. I could have one thought on one side, love, and I say, oh, we're going to release all the wonderful chemistry to make health and happiness. And yet, on the other side, if I see fear then I'm going to release totally different chemistry, which has a totally different selection of genes and behavior. And all of a sudden I say, yes, your mind is translating a thought into chemistry and the chemistry complements the thought. Our thoughts of positive love, happiness, joy. I'm excited to be here. I love this planet. Or is it like, oh my God, can I make it through? Do I have enough money? Will I have health care coverage? Will I have food? Will I have a place to live? I go, wow, totally different chemistry. Yeah. And, and this is where my research from 1967, 50 some years ago, revealed when I was cloning stem cells, I put genetically identical cells in three Petri dishes. So each dish, all the dishes had genetically identical cells. But I changed the chemistry of the culture medium slightly and feed each dish with a slight different culture medium. And, and in one dish, the cells form muscle. and another dish, the cells form bone. and a third dish, the cells form fat cells. I go, wait, they were genetically identical. What, what controlled the fate of the cells? And the answer was the chemistry of the culture medium. And now all of a sudden the big, oh my God, and that is this. When you see yourself in the mirror, you see yourself as a single entity. But the truth is, no, you are a skin-covered Petri dish under your skin, <laughs> 50 trillion cells. And I go, yeah, and culture medium, what is culture medium? It's the laboratory version of blood. So why is it relevant? Here you are, human, skin-covered, 50 trillion cells under the skin-covered dish with culture medium. I go, and culture medium is blood. And I go, yeah, and what did the research show? Change the chemistry of the culture medium and you change the fate of the cells. Question is this, does it make a difference if the cell is in a plastic culture dish or a skin covered culture dish? The answer is absolutely not. The fate of the cell is controlled by the culture medium. In the dish, what I make in the laboratory, in the body, is what the brain is creating through its chemistry. So if you're worried about getting fat, for example, or you're worried that you are fat and that you're never gonna get to a place where you're happy diet-wise, are you creating fat cells maybe? Yeah, you are certainly uh, supporting their, their function and their continued existence. Because what's your image? What are you focusing on? It's like people, let's say they have cancer and, uh, and they wanna have health. I say, yeah, but what are you focusing on? the cancer. I want the cancer to go away. I go, you keep focusing on the cancer. You actually yeah. have to focus on health because if you focus on cancer, what's the picture? Cancer. And yeah. then what's the consequence? Manifestation of the picture. And this is the, so the simple and yet most profound 
understanding. Yeah, I remember when we put mom, my mom on chemotherapy, we created a new name for it. It was like the feel good medicine or get better medicine. We had a new name for it rather than calling it chemo because we had such a negative reaction to that word. Um, so, and I've always believed that we have the power with our minds to, to change things, whether it's, you know, healing someone, you know, with thought, I know that sounds crazy, but maybe not to you. If you focus not on shrinking me. a tumor, oh. <laughs> which I've done, right? Like I'll sit there and I'll spend hours focusing on shrinking a tumor in my head. I believe that we have that power. Am I crazy to believe that? No, in fact, uh, that's the way out of the problem right now is because if you give up your power to somebody else, you have lost control of your own life. Your thoughts are controlling your life. I can't let somebody else give me my my thoughts because, first of all, they could give me all the wonderful, oh, you're going to heal yourself, you're going to be really great. And I go, did that change the subconscious program that gave me the problem? And I said, no, look, whether they're talking to you or you're talking to you, that didn't change the subconscious program. You have to be the one. We have to own responsibility. Yeah. And we have been programmed that we are not responsible. Yep. Genes yep. did it. Nature did it. Yep. They did it. And it's like, my God, you're creator. Let's own the creation because we're the only one that can change that creation. And everything and that's, that you're saying, you have tested and has been repeatedly tested. So this is not just your take on something. This is this is all scientifically proven. Absolutely. At this point, this is the this is the the basic reality. Except that I, well, I'm going to have to be honest. <laughs> Um, there are parties out there that are not interested in you having power. Yeah. I'll give you a good yeah. example. The pharmaceutical industry does not want you to heal yourself because then you're not a customer anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've known this because I've been involved with a lot of uh, former pharmaceutical executives and things over the last 50 years of my research that uh, they don't want to heal you because if they heal you, there's no business in it. In fact, it's always been under the cover and that's the discussion. And yet just recently I saw Goldman Sachs in a, uh, you know, a, a board meeting for all of its investors had their research director uh, tell them we should not invest in drugs that heal people because this is bad business. I mean, now it's in the public. They're just out there saying, no, we don't want to heal people. And that's a public, that was a public meeting. It's like, they do not want to invest in things that heal you because there's no profit in it. Yeah, they have no shame. I um, In this book that I was reading, I wanted to ask you about this because they talk about the biology of consciousness, right? So Lyle Watson, I'm sure you're familiar with his work. Yes. Um, yes. He was talking about this um, popularly called hundredth monkey principle, where he found that after a group of monkeys learned a new behavior, suddenly other monkeys on other islands with no possible normal means of communication learned that behavior too. So talk about that <laughs> well, wait, for a no, minute. There, there are possible means of communication, but not the, the way that we perceive of communication is direct physical contact, direct yeah. chemical contact. It's in the no, field. It's in the field, and the field shapes matter. Let me give you a quote from Albert Einstein. Perfect quote. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle. The field, the energy, is the sole governing agency of matter, particle. It's the thought, it's the field that is governing all this. This is fundamental physics. Now, of course, the biology is revealing, oh yeah, there's a mechanism, a thought, is translated into chemistry, the chemistry is put in the blood, the blood is sent to the body to do what? Shape the body to conform to the thought, whether it's a positive thought or a negative thought. Yeah. <laughs> That's the issue. And so if we think about that, right, our behavior, like my behavior and my believing that we have the power to heal ourselves and to, to do great things that, you know, in, in the regular, you know, world of thinking isn't even, you know, considered, we're able to affect people like the monkeys were able to affect people, right? Right. By numbers. 
by numbers and you go, okay, what the hell does that mean? Well, let me explain it to you. If I put wires on your head, I could read your brain activity. It's called electroencephalograph, EEG. I'm reading your brain activity because the electrical activity of the brain is conducted up to the skin. The wires on the skin read the activity and then I could see your brain function. Fine. The belief is that our thoughts are contained in our head. And I go, yeah, but guess what? There's a new device, a relatively new device, that reads brain activity, not electroencephalograph, it's called magnetoencephalograph, reading magnetic fields. I go, why is it relevant? The probe is outside, doesn't even touch your head. Uh, probe is out here and I'm reading your brain activity. What? <laughs> what does that mean? It means this, your thoughts are not contained in your head, you're broadcasting them. If I put a device out there, I could read your thoughts from out here. And you go, so why is it relevant? Well, every human is the equivalent of a tuning fork, vibrations coming from their thoughts. When you get a large number of people to have the very same thought, then the energy field is very strong because each one is adding their energy to that thought. The more people that have the same thought, the more the reality expresses itself. And if Everybody out there has a thought that, you know, we have to go to war. And I sit here and I go, no, I have a positive thought. We can have peace. And I go, am I going to change the world? And I go, not as a single individual. Why? I can influence my personal life. But if everybody else is creating a field that there's going to be war, that energy vibration, that field strength is so great that it overrides me. And that's why all of a sudden you say, well, then how come the world works this way? And I say, because we've all been programmed to accept this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And if we want to change it, we have to change it as a group of people. Uh, and this is what we're seeing in the world right now. There's an evolution going on that is challenging everything. That the world is in a, a state of, um, of chaos. It's not, you know, everything's like, what the heck is going on? And the answer is this. There's a belief change that's changing across the entire field. And as people start to acquire the new belief, which is self-empowerment, the belief of how our consciousness is creating this particular world, uh, the more people that believe it, the more the reality will manifest itself. Uh, and so we're caught in a world of change. Mm -hmm. And we need this world of change because the behaviors that we have been using are the behaviors that are precipitating our own extinction. We are in an extinction phase because of our behavior. You want to survive this? then we have to change behavior right away. Yeah, uh, and, and that's, that's by education this and learning program, this. You, well, this is why your, your, your program is so important to, to give people ideas, new visions, new vibrations that, that can bring health and harmony to the planet. Love is, is the answer. Love has always been there. A child is born in love until it learns not to love. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I wonder... Um, you know, you talk about um, consciousness and intent. How important is intent? Oh, that's the, you have a vision. Uh, an intention is I have a vision of some destination. Well, the moment you are setting out the vision, that, that you're manifesting a field. Now, the question is, uh, will your Christ, you know, well, this is the conscious mind. Intention is creative, and conscious mind is creative as opposed to subconscious mind, which is habitual. So an intention is a creative vision. Now, the issue is this. Will I manifest my intention? And I say, well, now it's a trade-off between your positive intention and your perhaps negative programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and if negative programming doesn't change then unfortunately, just doing the math 95% of the day with a processor that's a million times more powerful than the conscious mind, uh, then you recognize, then your life is not coming from your creativity, it's coming from your program. So it's, it's like what Esther Hicks talks about in um, Ask and It Is Given. Your desire and your beliefs have to be completely in line for you to get what you want because you can desire something, but if you don't believe you're going to get it, you're creating the block. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, uh, people have demonstrated this to themselves all the time, but never own that. Oh my God, I created something. Uh, especially if it's negative, that's the last thing. Is I created this, you know. And people get uh, le le this is an important point. Let me. I I want to just mention it. Um, when we start to find out that we are creators, 
and we start to look at our health. And we start to see that there are issues of facing us like cancer or heart disease or whatever it is. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, well, you created that. The first thing a person's going to do is go, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd, I wouldn't do this. Uh, and, and, and then they feel their, their words. Let me just put a few of them. Guilt, shame, blame, victim. Those are a few right there. I go, why do we, why do we have those, those, those beliefs? Uh, uh, and why do we resist owning who we are? Because if that belief comes up and says, somebody says, uh, oh, you caused your cancer. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't do that. I resist this belief. And it goes, well, you did create the cancer, but here's the most important point. Those words, victim, blame, shame, guilt, only apply is if you already know there's a right way to do something. And in spite of knowing that, you do something different. Mm. Meaning, I knew there was a good way to stay healthy, but I decided to do this. And, and now I'm sick. Then I say, oh, okay, well, that's pretty guilty. And you got some blame and stuff like that. But then here's the other point. If you have no idea of this programming, this behavior, everything we're talking about, then you cannot use the words blame, shame, victim, and guilt. Because if you had no awareness of it, then how can you be guilty of uh, misdirecting things? Mm -hmm. You had no consciousness of it. Uh, And so those words have to be eliminated because those are the things that keep people from wanting to own their life because they would say, I wouldn't want to do that. I'm not guilty of this. And so they resist that the fact that they've created it just to avoid being guilty when I say guilt, blame, shame, victim, all those. Get rid of those words because ignorance, (laughs) if no one told you this and you were never programmed with this, how can you be blamed? If I, if I say, hey, take my car and go to town, you get in the car and say, oh, it's standard shift. I don't know how to drive that. I say, yeah, don't worry about it. Just take the car. And you go down the street, bucking down the street <laughs> with the car. And then you call me an hour later saying, you know, the, the car is broken. Can I blame you for that? Can I say you're guilty of destroying my car? And the answer was this. You didn't know how to drive the car. And I told you to do it anyway. Yep. So what was the point? There, there's no blame. Not You can't accept blame, shame, guilt, victim. And the idea is what? Without an awareness of this, we are ignorant of this. And this is the ignorance that pervades the entire culture almost, that we are victims of a world when, in fact, we are creators of the world. But until you learn you are creating it and learn how to change that creation, mm-hmm then you cannot be guilty of creating a cancer. You had no idea in the world what was going on. No one told you. But now, once you start to learn this, <laughs> now you have responsibilities. Yeah. So I want to ask you in terms of manifesting, if time isn't linear, and we all have discussed this, I think, at length, right? Time isn't linear. And even when I interviewed Anita Morjani, are you familiar with her? I love her. She's a dear friend. She's amazing. So the fact that, you know, when she was on the other side, she said past and future were all happening at the same time and time isn't linear. If the future's already happened, we don't necessarily have to worry about it. But how much of our will determines whether those things happen or not? For example, if I want certain things in my life, but I am a believer in manifestation and visualization and allowing things to come and the right things will come. How much do I need to do to assist the manifestation of these things? Because, you know, we could all hope for a million dollars. I want a million dollars and I'm, I know I'm going to get the million dollars. I always say you have to do the work too, but maybe there's something else that I don't know. Well, the, the only thing you don't know is that the program that says, uh, how, how likely is it that you will make a million dollars? And all of a sudden you go, well, from the world experiences, it's like it's going to be really hard, very difficult to do this and probably never going to happen and all that. And I say, oh, my God, you just canceled your intention based on a program of belief that you see in the world. You know, it's interesting because the same topic about money, uh, there's a book called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yep. 
And what does it talk about? It says, if you got programmed in a poor family, then your program is no matter what you do, you're going to be poor. In contrast, if you get programmed in a rich family, even if you're unconscious, because you see, consciousness had nothing to do with it, it had to do with the program, you can stay rich even if you're stupid. <laughs> because program is not coming from your conscious mind, it's coming from the subconscious program you've got in your family. So rich people tend to stay rich, poor people tend to stay, you know, tend to stay poor. It's not because of their intention, it's because of the foundational programming. So if we change the programming, that opens up any future vision to be a completely different vision than the one that you have with the existing program. Mm -hmm. But also in life, like for example, this last year and a half, I had brain surgery a year and a half ago. And ever since I looked at it as a gift, I looked at it as my life was happening for me, not to me. And this was my gift to change my life and, and change things. And I have dramatically, I mean, dramatically changed things. Um, and I'm so much happier because of it. And abundance is continuing to flow regardless of how much output I'm, I'm doing. But at some point, you know, like my husband looks at me and he's like, you can't just sit here and think that it's always going to come. You have to do some of the work. Like you have to put yourself out there. You have to do more. And it's not that I'm not doing stuff. Like I'm developing stuff behind the scenes that I'm really passionate about and excited about. But I guess for, and it's, it's not just me, I'm using myself as an example. There are so many people who have, you know, these dreams and I guess how much of it just happens because the belief and the desire is there and you manifest it and how much of it do you have to help along as well? Well, basically the first thing is this, if you don't have an intention, you can't get there. So that's the first thing. So I say, but an intention is a creative thought and a creative thought by definition is the, that's what the conscious mind is all about, creativity. But I can have all the greatest intentions I want, but if my subconscious programs are limitations, mm -hmm. then that's where the conflict comes in. I could sit here and say, oh, oh I'm going to be healthy. and I'm going to be rich. I'm going to have all this stuff. And then my life doesn't work out that way. And I go, geez, those intentions weren't any good. And I go, no, it wasn't the intentions. It was the limitations of the programming uh, and so the reality is do you actually have to get up and fulfill those intentions you wanted do you have to go out in the street and, and, and go out there and compete with all that and I say no basically what you have to do is maintain the intention and reveal your subconscious programs by looking at your life and if you find your subconscious programs are limiting you because that's where limitation comes from mm -hmm. Uh, intention will not manifest until you change the subconscious programming. Wow. Wow. It seems like it's actually not that hard. And I've used hypnotherapy in the last few years, uh, and it was really, really helpful. Um, and one of the things I learned at a Tony Robbins seminar is, you know, you can allow the world to program your mind or you can program your mind. So I always thought about that. And in the morning, when I'm getting ready, I'm always listening to positive things like that to help me get in the right state for the day. But I think... Uh, right. And then, then look at, at the day as it unfolds. And if you find resistance to those positive thoughts that you had in the morning, it didn't come from the conscious mind. That's not resistant. The only resistance is subconscious. And that's where the opportunity is. As I said, you want to know your subconscious, just look at your life. Wherever there's struggle, it's not coming that the universe is not giving it to you. The struggle is an, in, an inside job. <laughs> it's coming from your own subconscious programming. Uh, and as I said, 70% uh, psychologist figure uh, of that programming that we get in the first seven years is negative, disempowering, and self-sabotaging. We're all, we're all affected by it until you step outside. Uh, and stepping outside, uh, another, uh, you know, I said, what was there? I said, first it was hypnosis, and then I said there was uh, the uh, uh, habituation, okay? And then I mentioned energy psychology. Let me give you a fourth belief change thing, but here's what's unique about it. I can tell you what it is, but I can't encourage or engage it by consciousness. And I say, it's a radical uh, life experience, physical or spiritual. Mm. So, for example, uh, you sit in a doctor's office, and all of a sudden, the doctor says, well, I hate to tell you this, but you have an inoperable brain tumor. It's like, 
holy crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At that moment, consciousness can change. You can walk away with either two different, two different perceptions. One, oh, poor me, my cells, my biology are not supporting me. And now I'm going to suffer through this. And you already envisioned the pathway of the, of the, of the cancer. Or you can say, oh my God, my life's not in order. It's just not working right. I, it's, I got to change my life. I got to get out of that stupid job. I have to get away from this relationship. It's toxic and blah, blah, blah. I say, and the difference is, those that recognized that it was the way you're living are the ones that have the greatest opportunity to get rid of the cancer because they're going to change the source of the cancer. People think the cancer is the problem. The truth is cancer is a symptom of a problem. You want to blame the cancer cells. So I say, fine, take all the cancer cells out. Go ahead, do, do the operation. T t go ahead, c cut out the cancer. I say, is that going to change? I go, well, it depends on if you believe the cells were stupid or your life was stupid. <laughs> huh. If you think the cells were stupid, then you say, oh, I have no responsibility. The cells did it. I'm just a victim of my cells. Guess what? That person is the most likely one to see the cancer come back right away. In contrast, the one who sits there and goes, oh, my God, my life is not right. I have to change my life. And they get it up and they change their life. They're the most likely ones never to get the cancer again because the cancer didn't happen because of a genetic accident. That's an, that's an excuse. The fact is, how many genes does it take to get a cancer off the ground? About 200 genes, 15 just to get it started. I go, 15 genes? They saying, oh, I spontaneously mutated 15 genes and that's how I got a cancer. It's like, no, it was already in process. It was already coming from consciousness. And those that say, okay, my life sucks and that's why I got the cancer. So I'm going to quit my job. And if I only have a few months left, I'm going to go on the road, take my money and enjoy the last days of my life. And guess what? They go on the road and then it's one month and two months and it's a year and a, two years and they're still there. I go, where's the cancer? And they have to resist. Changing the life, which was causing the cancer, mm -hmm. also allows the cancer to disappear. And stop blaming the cells, because that's then I'm a victim. When the truth is, the cells are responding to environmental information. And uh, this is a whole new area of research, which is really exciting. Uh, a term called exosomes. Uh, if you've never heard of it, you will. Yep. It is the future of medicine, exosomes. Uh, and it's how our mind creates viruses that affect our own body. Unbelievable. I, um, I, it's funny. I feel like anybody who goes through these life changing moments, um, and does see the light in it all goes through it even easier. Like I know that I went through my situation in such an easier way than had I been negative and why me and oh, my mom had brain surgery just eight months ago and now I have it. I can't believe it. You know, I think declaring it's a, it was a gift for me to change my life allowed me to do just that and to be positive through it. And when I look back, I don't feel like I went through some terrible time and, you know, I had difficulties. I wasn't able to walk. I had to use my walker and my balance was off and it was really difficult, but I only know it when I look at the videos and I'm like, wow, that poor girl, she went through a lot, but I don't connect with it because I wasn't feeling like that then. No, uh, uh, this is, this is the part where uh, your, your whole life experience becomes so critical is because if you get caught up in the illness then you become the illness. Yeah. If you go beyond that and say, no, no, you know, uh, my life, I need to fix my life. That's really what the uh, a symptom is, is a feedback. Your biology is telling you you're not in harmony. Yeah. And the symptom is a reflection of where that harmony is not, uh, where it's in state of disharmony, in fact. It's very interesting. A dear friend of ours also had a tumor right near her ear. Uh, and uh, she got all the bad reports about this tumor and they wanted to do stuff. And she used uh, the energy psychology stuff to check into her beliefs. You know, it was interesting. I think a lot of it had to do with she didn't want to hear a lot of things that were going on. And so her vision, I don't want to hear, led to what? 
a, 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 a tumor to block a tumor it. that compressed her, on her hearing and she couldn't hear. And guess what? It stopped growing and she it changed her life because it was the belief that was really the issues she had to work on. So with energy work, um, I've recently been working with uh, Dr. John Amaral. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he, you know, he works on clearing the body of energy blocks and using the field and all of it. And at first it was really hard to understand. And then when you see the results and the magnificent things that can be fixed, I mean, it's, I've had incredible results. Um, do you feel that people are, are moving more towards that and, and that that is going to be a powerful tool in the future in healing? It is the tool. It is the one thing. It is time to let go of, oh, I'm a physical reality based on my genes, based on my physical cells, and go, according to physics, no, you're not. <laughs> in fact, the, the, the idea that we see physical things, like uh, me, you see me on the screen, I like this physical thing. I go, this is an illusion. It's an illusion of light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that light bounces off of energy. I'm an energy body with light coming off, bouncing off, and you can see me. If I shut off the lights and I'm in the dark, you can't see me anymore. I go, yeah, but you know what? I can do a CAT scan. I can do a PET scan. I, I can do an MRI scan. And I say, I can see all your organs, all your body parts. I go, you're, you're only seeing energy because the scan isn't a, a photo uh, related thing. It's an energy field. You can see every part of your body only as energy when you use the scan. And that's what we are energy. So owning this is the most important step to say, if I want to change my physical expression, which is energy, then I have to change the energy. And this is where healing is going to come from. It's not going to come from pills, pharmaceutical agents at all. It's going to come from your consciousness is creating this quantum physics and your consciousness when changing can change all of this quantum physics. And it seems like their environment or your environment, you know, is probably a big contributor to whatever illness and maybe removing yourself from that environment, whether it's a bad relationship, a bad toxic work environment, all of those things, you need to kind of switch that up. And that's almost like the signal. I, I say God's throwing bricks at me. God threw a brick at me. I didn't <laughs> listen. He threw some more bricks at me, heavier ones this time. It's like, oh, I got to change things. And so yes. wherever the negative or that bad feeling is, that's what you need to fix probably. Absolutely. And th this is why I'm trying to say, we achieve what we, the body's got a problem, so I'm going to fix the body. And I say, no, the body is a complement to the consciousness. You want to change the body. Don't try and physically change the body. First change the consciousness. Mm -hmm. and yeah, because the body's making the, body the noise because of change. that. Because what? The body's making the noise for you to make the change. It's feedback. That's what I'm trying to say. Our issues are symptoms, not the problem. We always say, oh, the cancer cell's the problem. I go, no, the cancer cell came about as a symptom of something higher that's off. And we want to fix the cancer cell down here when the fact is, no, the problem is up here. Uh, and so I don't care how many times you go through the operation and get chemotherapy and all that kind of stuff. Like if you don't change this process, the physical expression is just a manifestation of a consciousness. Wow. Bruce, Dr. Lipton, yes. what would you, whatever yes. you prefer, I can't thank you enough for sharing all of this information and for being so brave in the face of <laughs> ridicule and all of the things that you've had to endure to to finally be uh, accepted and revered and believed um, because I know <laughs> it, it was a long journey and um, you've helped us break through to a whole other side. So thank you. Well, I want to thank you for letting me give this story. And I also have to say, listen, uh, when I saw my results and I, told all my peers about it. They ignored it because it didn't conform to their belief system at the time, which was genetics. Uh, and so what was my choice? Well, disbelieve whatever I saw in my lab and ignore it. But the point was, I said, no, no, this is true. 
I have to change my life to accommodate my belief. And, and, and the most beautiful part was once I changed my life, which got rid of, first of all, death. That was one of the first things that I saw in that my cells are picking up a, a signal with these antennas that the signal's there, whether the cell's there or not, uh, and uh, other things. And what was the result? I haven't had a doctor since 1992. I haven't had insurance since 1992 uh, when all of a sudden I started to say, no, let's put into application everything I've talked about. And I have been healthy. I have been happy. I don't take pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, I feel wonderful. You know, I'm going on to, what, 74, 5 or something. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's not relevant. Yeah. It's not relevant yeah. because it, it's what you see going through your eyes this way, but I'm generating the picture in my head. And the manifestation outside becomes a compliment. My life got so good. My life got so healthy. And after a 17-year mantra that I will never get married again because of the emotional problems the first time I got a divorce, I never want to do that again. After 17 years and reprogramming relationships, uh, which I got from studying my mother and father as an infant, and my God, they were dysfunctional, where, where could I go? Uh, and now uh, I have such a wonderful relationship that I even my book called The Honeymoon Effect is oh, that's a great example. Let me close with that if I can. Yeah, okay? of course. Your life could suck every day, blah, 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 blah. And then one day you meet someone and you fall in love. And guess what? 24 hours later, you got a whole different life. Oh my God, everything is so much more beautiful. The food's great, the music's great, the company is wonderful. Even my job, it doesn't bother me. I'm having a great life. I'm experiencing heaven on earth. I go, you mean your life sucked every day, and then you meet someone, you fall in love, and 24 hours later you have heaven on earth. I go, what was all about? And now we know scientifically why. When we fall in love, we stop thinking. Mm -hmm. We start being present. It's called being mindful. Being mindful means I'm keeping my conscious mind in the front. I'm not thinking so much. I'm enjoying everything that's in front of me. Mm -hmm. So if I stop thinking, what happens? I stop defaulting to the subconscious. And the moment I stop defaulting from the subconscious, now I'm creating without the negative input of that subconscious. And what did I create? Heaven on earth. I'm not the only one that does this. But it happens all the time. And then I go, yeah, but then the honeymoon, which is so heaven on earth and so darn beautiful, seems to disappear. And I go, inevitably, the reason is simple. I don't care how much you're in love. You still have a job. You have chores. There's things you got to do. You start thinking. Mm -hmm. I go, well, what happens when you start thinking? Oh, your behavior defaults to the subconscious programming, which was negative in the first place. I go, why is it relevant? You fell in love. Uh, with your partner because both of you were living in the conscious creative moment consciousness creativity you're both creating love health happiness and then i said then what happens over time all of a sudden thinking has to come back in and the moment you start thinking all of a sudden those programs that never played during the honeymoon start to show up because now you're thinking and now the automatic program kicks mm. in and i go what's the consequence of that and i said that's in the end of the honeymoon happens why because all of a sudden these behaviors that were negative that never played when you were deeply in that love start to manifest and your partner all of a sudden sees behaviors like, where did that come from? Mm. Who are you? What kind of behavior is that? And all of a sudden, guess what? The honeymoon starts to disappear because you're not now creating from consciousness. You are returning back to the negative programs, which will sabotage any honeymoon relationship. So... Is it because you're present, you're not in the subconscious? That, that's right. With the that if you keep, that's what mindfulness, Buddhist mm. mindfulness is all about. What yeah. is mindfulness? If I keep my conscious mind present and stop thinking yep. and just live, yes. I'm living right now. If you stop thinking, then guess what? Then anything you're creating is now not coming from subconscious because that only happens when you're thinking. If you stop thinking, then your creative source is your conscious mind. Well, that's the one with wishes and desires. So the moment you start thinking, guess what? That is the moment where your creativity can manifest heaven on earth. And it's called the honeymoon. And that's 
That's, uh, I mean, that's, and it doesn't have to be with another person. That's very important. If you find something that so takes and invests your consciousness, art, gardening, cooking, whatever, if you find some pastime that is so engaging with your conscious mind that you're not thinking, that is the equivalent of the honeymoon effect. Mm -hmm. You get healthy. You get healthy doing it. I love it. What a great way to end. I think that's so amazing because that's where we need to be is living in the present because absolutely that's where joy is. So yes. Oh, what an amazing conversation. If you're ever in Los Angeles, will you remember me? I want to do a part two. I will so remember you because I enjoy this opportunity to be with you and especially your audience because the idea is consciousness requires some understanding and we have just been who we are we are not victims and so thank you another way of looking at life of a better course. way your teacher you're so good at explaining on a on a smaller level and i know our audience is looking it and uh, we're going to get a lot of feedback so thank you thank you thank you have an amazing day in new zealand i love it <laughs> it's another world. <laughs> I'm sure. I haven't visited there yet, but uh, but I can tell it's it's a beautiful place. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Ah, oh, it was literally an honor. I could have had that interview go for another two hours. I might have maybe needed a bathroom break or something. But he is so fascinating, and I've used hypnotherapy. I've kind of forgotten about it for a little while, but I'm gonna start back up. And uh, if you don't have a hypnotherapist that you love, of course, we have Mary Ida Kendall, who's been on a past show that you can listen to. But if you go on YouTube, you can listen to Esther Hicks guided meditations before you go to sleep. And she will help you with manifesting what you want. So I highly encourage you to do that. Thank you again for listening to our free conversations with Maria Menounos. Please help us by rating, commenting, subscribing on Apple Podcasts. If you love the show, be sure to tell a friend. In the meantime, follow us at Maria Menounos, at Bruce Lipton, at Steph Sabra, at Stephen Lemieux Photo. And remember, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. <laughs>